Paul Wallace, my friends, the man that needs no introduction. Today, we are going to get to the bottom of some things. Is the Vatican withholding information, technology, and suppressing knowledge? The manipulation of our currencies worldwide has been happening for centuries, and we're going to give you some alternative motivations for why the U.S. invaded Iraq and why there's a perpetual state of war on earth. As always, all of the things that Paul studies and delves into have practical applications for you and your life. Understanding the past will help you lead a better present and better future for yourself. The name Yahweh is translated as the Lord, with Lord in capitals. So unfortunately, when Christians read the Hebrew scriptures and see the Lord, naturally they think these are stories of God. But you go back to the beginning of Christian history and there were plenty of really central church fathers who said the Yahweh stories and Elohim stories cannot be understood as God's stories because they are morally incompatible with the teachings of Jesus. The behavior of the entity Yahweh is incompatible with Christian morality. Make sure to listen closely for what this can do for you and check out our Rumble, people. Check out Rumble. We put out videos on other platforms. Check out our Rumble. Check out our new TikTok. Check out everything from us and our sponsors right down below. And we will see you guys on the jump. Enjoy the podcast. Wave, Will John. Welcome back, my friends. Paul Wallace, for the second time, back by popular demand. How's it going? How are you doing? G'day, Will. I'm fantastic. And yourself? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And uh, as always, in a discussion like this and for a subject like yours, we are going to try and get some answers uh, on a lot of stuff that we're curious about. And I know most people are already going to have an understanding of who you are, but if you could just very briefly let everyone know why you're so knowledgeable on all these subjects we're getting ready to talk about. Well, people know me as the paleo contact guy, and paleo contact is the theory that our ancestors had contact with other civilizations, meaning extraterrestrial civilizations, in the deep past. And my route into it has been through a background in church ministry, 33 years as a theological educator, training pastors in the interpretation of ancient texts, as a church doctor and an archdeacon for the Anglican Church in Australia. And it's been through studying the ancient texts, going to the root meanings of the key words, and then looking at where these texts have come from, what the sources are and how they differ from the sources. That's the field that has opened up these paleo contact narratives in the Bible and that have sent me around the world listening to indigenous story that seems all around the world to carry the same memory. And <clears throat> I don't have a great segue for this because I'm already just straight into my, my questions, but there's always, throughout the Bible, we have these questions on who really, who is Ezekiel, who is Moses, who is really, who are these people, who are the gods, you know, and who are the angels, who are the, we have these questions on who these people are and and uh, what, what sort of role they would still play in today. As we get into something here on entities, entities is the word we use now to kind of describe this over-encompassing, overarching uh, people, things that we don't understand, uh, either from the other world or that are potentially manipulating us through some, some way. So could you touch on uh, the role that entities, perhaps, and maybe uh, draw a distinguishing uh, line between what are entities, what are aliens, who are the shadow people? Just maybe we could get an idea of these characters that play a role in the Bible and, and how you see it. Sure. Well, entities is a, a word that probably makes uh, mainstream Christian believers a little uncomfortable because they're, they're very comfortable with the traditional translations of the kinds of entities that are in the Bible. So they're used to talking about God and the devil and Satan and angels and demons, and that sort of about encompasses everything. And so the whole of reality has to fit in these boxes of animal, vegetable, mineral, God, the devil, angels or demons, and there's nothing else. And one of the problems with that is that it doesn't describe our experience, our lived experience. People have anomalous experiences, close encounters, and there's no language available there to describe what's happening. So that's one problem. But the other problem is that those translations don't do justice to the spectrum of entities in the Bible. So we come to the Elohim, 
And we're used to seeing that word translated as God or gods, but it can be translated as landlords or chieftains. It can refer to angels and it can refer to um, negative entities. Why is there that great elasticity? And one of the things I argue in my Eden series is we should leave it untranslated and watch what the Elohim do, watch how they behave. So the Elohim is the Bible's earliest word that gets translated as God. There's an entity called El Shaddai. People are used to hearing that translated as the Almighty. But if you go to the most authoritative lexicons like Brown Drivers Briggs or to very transparent Bible translations like the New Jerusalem Bible, they'll tell you squarely that's an invented translation. It really means the powerful one, the destroyer. Then we have El Elyon, the powerful one, more powerful than the other powerful ones, is essentially what that means. And then we have Yahweh, which is a word with no meaning. It's a mystery word with no etymology in the Hebrew language. Again, we have to watch how that entity behaves to work out what's going on there. We have entities who have names like Asherah and Dagon, who are beings remembered by the ancients for their tutelage in agronomy. These beings came from far away, came to the planet and taught our ancestors how to become farmers and how to build civilizations. We read words like angels and we think we know what it means, except it hasn't told us what kind of entity we're looking at. The word angel just means something on a mission or on an assignment with a message. And we look at how some of those behave and you and I would begin to think, hang on, we have a different word for that in the 21st century. And if you leave some of these key words untranslated, just leave them as they are in the text. Look at how they behave and you'll begin to recognize patterns of arrival from outer space, arrival through portals, flying technology, uh, military technology, uh, new information provided to humanity. And you realize that we've got a whole sequence of close encounters and experiences of first contact being described. And it's as you go back to the root meanings of these words that the contact aspect of these stories becomes unmissable. Now, a lot of believers pick this up in the stories already. So Jacob's ladder with these beings arriving from space, landing, going back up into space through a hole in the sky, or Elijah being taken away in a chariot of fire through a whirlwind wind, or the Ruach flying around, creating vortices of wind and terraforming the devastated planet. There are all these clues there that we're looking at the arrival of forces with technology who are now going to interact with our ancestors, and our ancestors have to interpret what's going on with the language they had at the time. And one of the things that you just mentioned there, which is something that you address in the invasion, <clears throat> invasion of Eden, uh, the relationship that we have with these entities, uh, as I'll continue to call them, and now, are we, and you asked the question, is history repeating itself? Are, are we getting ready for something? Is something like this going to happen again? Is there, what is, where do we, where do we go from that? Because there's so much different, there's so many different takes on what that is. Where do you think we're going? Definitely. Well, I think we're, whether we're listening to the Hebrew story of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, or if we're listening to indigenous Hawaiian story, indigenous Celtic story, ancient Norse story, our ancestors are all saying with one voice that no understanding of the world is complete until we understand that there is a non-human layer to the governance of our planet. And so they're telling us how things were for them, but they're giving us a lens through which to understand current reality. And I think I may have mentioned last time we were talking, Will, Hayam Ashed, the Brigadier General, who for 28 years was Israel's Chief of Space Security, he made an amazing statement in 2020, saying that we've been in contact for more than 70 years and that there's a galactic federation in place that is moderating project or oversighting at the very least Project Earth. And when he said that, he is saying what is happening in the present is the same as the Celts was describing in uh, 17th century Scotland, as the Hawaiians were describing in the stories of the Mo'o centuries ago. 
uh, as you can hear, an African story from out of Nigeria, from out from the Yoruba people, the Edo people, the Efik people, the Dogon people of Mali. They all have these stories of contact with rulers in the past who are non-human. And the suggestion is there. This is how you understand geopolitics in the present. You have to recognize all these layers, that you've got visible leaders and then elites who pull strings. And then above the elites is this non-human layer who have certain parameters that they're setting for Project Humanity. And so but that's what's always been fascinating to me. And I've read, you know, different anecdotal stories about people coming into contact with uh, parts of the government or organizations uh, that are fully functioning the same way our government would work. Uh, I mean, for a lack of a better term, uh, almost like these men in black, if you remember, of course, that, that or, uh, like organizations with their ability to run the, the underlay, you know, the underlying uh, world of our... And, and so I'm, I'm curious... This would change everything if this was the current, because what does it mean to elect a senator, a mayor, uh, you know, even a president, if there's a whole layer of things that we're not understood and told? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand where we are in the fix if we have any power whatsoever. And I know it's, it's like this uh, almost a nihilistic viewpoint, but... With all this information, what is that? Where does that place us? Like, are we worker bees? Are we slaves? Are is our consciousness free? Are we stronger than the other? Where do you feel that this places us actually as humans? Like, what can we do? Well, I think what makes the picture a little bit less bleak is when we realize that we are in a spectrum of company and that whichever period you go to, whichever people group you listen to, they all suggest that we have a spectrum of demographics who visit us and who oversight us with varying agendas. And the reason there is a, a sky council, as the Bible would call it, or the El Ba'adat, the Council of Powers, or a galactic federation, is because there is some kind of a matrix of agreements at determining what's happening. So we have forces here who I believe are very pro-human who love human beings, who are closely related to us, who have been present in all the major advances that we can think of in our human story. The advances that took us from living like animals on the planet's surface to knowing how to light a fire, which is the beginning of material science, knowing how to make a farm, which is the beginning of civilization, metal technology, major changes happen through benevolent interaction with visitors. If you go to the Babylonian story, the explanation for the explosion of Sumerian civilization is all credited to visitors from the stars, ultimately, which is the Apkalu story, Oannes and the Apkalu. Asherah in the Bible, a helper, Dagon, a helper, Hunhunapu in Mesoamerica, uh, Mbabwana Warisa in Zulu story, a helper, and I believe that we have demographics like that in the present here to support the human experience. We may have other visitors who are not interested in us at all. They're interested in us as resources or our planetary resources. And this is why they're sort of bumping up against each other in some kind of uneasy truce uh, to police how things move forward. I feel that the agreements uh, tying these forces together are less watertight than they've been in the past, which is why there's been an acceleration of uh, disclosure. Uh, and I mean from our visitors, why there's been an acceleration of mass sightings and why almost as an insurance against disclosure, we've had this drip, drip feed of information from the Pentagon over the last five years in particular to bring us gradually into the picture. Because I think they're trying to avoid what you're implying, Will. They don't want an embarrassing shock horror moment when everyone realizes that our elected governments aren't really in charge. I think they're wanting to divert the conversation so that the great reveal will be, oh, we've got a bit more tech than we've told you about. And I think that's where they're wanting our focus to be in a funny kind of way. Yeah. And it does seem, I mean, and, and quite obviously it would make sense. I mean, if we, it's really funny when we do the, uh, uh, 
a discussion on aliens, we will blanket them as the greys are this or people from whatever planet, I don't know, uh, are this way. Humans, we know, come in very various different fashions and, and some are bad, some are good, some are in the between, some don't care about anybody, some care, want to control. And so it makes sense throughout the universe that we are a microcosm of everything that we can you know, see out there. Absolutely. And our human experience should mean that we shouldn't be naive to company. We, we will understand that you can have allies and you can have enemies and that sometimes diplomacy has to be a subtle thing. You need to calculate who's on your side, but how powerful are they? How helpful can they be <laughs> against the others? And I think our own experience of invading each other's countries ought to give us some kind of shrewd awareness of what exopolitics might look like. I think the conversation that's happened in the last 12 months in Washington, this stoush between members of Congress and the Pentagon over secrecy around the program, it frames everything as a military threat. And I think that distorts the picture. I think we need to be having a more layered and subtle conversation about who are we in contact with and how do we move forward? What agreements are in place? Do we need to review them? Certainly, there have been agreements in place since the 1940s, since the Truman administration, and I go into that a little bit in the invasion of Eden. Do we need to look at that again? And can we please bring the light of a bit more scrutiny and accountability to what is happening? I have an old-fashioned belief in democracy that scrutiny actually helps decision-making. Yeah, I would agree uh, wholeheartedly. And it's actually, I, I want to talk about uh, Yahweh uh, specifically and, and back to the bleak side of things, but he had some technology, he had some abilities <laughs> and uh, ways of destruction that were unseen uh, even in today's terms of our mass uh, extinction possibilities. Could you touch on the difference between what Yahweh was capable of as compared to what we have and why that's important? For sure. I mean, I mean, if I say the word alien, a lot of people will think immediately Mars attacks uh, Independence Day. And there have been moments in our story that would seem to have been rather like that. And many of the Yahweh stories fit into that scheme. In fact, um, there is a whole group of visitors referred to in the Bible as the Tseva Hashemayim, the Sky Armies. So that gives you an idea of uh, whether or not they came in peace. Well, Yahweh was part of the Sky Armies. And we have details given of the technology that he used, the flying technology, the spacefaring technology, which you can find in 1 and 2 Kings, in Ezekiel, in Exodus. And when you get into Ezekiel, you have this uh, prophet being flown around in this craft, and we have descriptions of the textures that he's feeling, the feelings of G-forces, the sounds of the engine when it flies, and then the details of the weapons that are carried on this craft, which is called the Ruach, um, the wind maker, or the Kavod, the glory. And then he's shown a Kedi Mapaso and a Kedi Mashatal. And he's shown that six individuals are equipped, equipped with one of those. One is translated as the shattering thing, and the other as the disintegrating thing. And six individuals equipped with one of those each can ethnically cleanse an entire district. And just to give you a sense of scale as to what that might be, um, when the uh, World Trade Center was attacked, 2,996 people died. And that was a huge shock to the USA. Nothing like that had happened on American soil before. Um, Europeans, a little bit more familiar with the tax on that scale. D-Day, I think it was over 10,000 infantry killed on a single day. Londoners, a bit more familiar with the tax on a bigger scale. During the Blitz of London, between 40,000 and 43,000 Londoners were killed. Yahweh, in a single assault, killed 70,000 people. That dwarfs those other destructions, and that was in a single assault, which he made on his own infantry. And he did that as a message for one person. 
that was for an audience of one, his puppet king, David, as a message to him, you don't think about questioning my orders. All David had done was count his army, which is a very sensible thing to do if you're going to calculate whether to go to war or not. But Yahweh is saying, no, 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 your only calculation is if I tell you, you go. End of story. You don't need to know how many troops you have. And counting his troops was too close to questioning orders. And he could respond with, you know, one action, 70,000 people dead. So I don't think you can read the Yahweh stories as stories of, of something benevolent that was looking after his people group. It was a story of wars between Yahweh and other Elohim and thousands of people left dead through the years of those conflicts. And there's such a giant contrast between the Old Testament God, as we like to call it, which I'll go back to this, just using it because that's how we do it in modern times. They said the Old Testament God and New Testament God. Old Testament God seems angry. New Testament God seems, seems uh, let's love each other and everybody get along, you know, to some degree, let's say. But there is a definite big contrast. And so it poses the question, does Jesus, which I've, I've seen you discuss, but does Jesus or did Jesus worship Yahweh? Is there a difference between this? Was this completely connected or are they complete separate beings, complete separate ideas, complete, complete separate factions with different goals and different ideas for what the humanity you know, should have? What are your thoughts there? In a lot of Bibles, the name Yahweh is translated as the Lord with Lord in capitals. So unfortunately, when Christians read the Hebrew scriptures and see the Lord, naturally they think these are stories of God. But you go back to the beginning of Christian history and there were plenty of really central church fathers who said the Yahweh stories and Elohim stories cannot be understood as God's stories because they are morally incompatible with the teachings of Jesus. The behavior of the entity Yahweh is incompatible with Christian morality. So in a sense, Christians should be should have a head start here, recognizing that we've got narratives of some other kind of contact going on, but that translation confuses it. The moment you leave Yahweh untranslated and go and read those stories, you will start evaluating the moral behavior of that entity, and there's no way you will conclude that the theos about whom Jesus taught had anything to do with the Yahweh of those old stories. And it's a bit of a smoking gun that in all the Gospels and New Testament, neither Jesus nor anyone who writes for him ever uses the word Yahweh as a word for God. And there are plenty of places where Jesus distances himself from Yahweh. You've heard it said, but I say this. Moses allowed you this, but I say this. And then there's a famous moment where he says, what kind of father, uh, when his children are asking for food, would uh, give them a stone or snakes? And he's referring to a moment when Yahweh did exactly that to the starving tribes of Israel. If Jesus had been a worshipper of Yahweh, then Christians today would be Yahwists or following Yahwist law. But as soon as you've read as far as Acts 15, you realize Christianity isn't built on Yahwism. If Jesus had been a Yahwist, the Jerusalem Council could not have come to the decision it did in Acts 15, which was to say we're not building Christianity on faith in Yahweh's laws or the stories surrounding him. So really, it's a story of discontinuity between these uh, experiences of violent colonization by entities, including Yahweh, and what Jesus was teaching about. He taught about theos, which is the Greek concept of God, the source of the cosmos and everything in it that in which we all live and move and have our being, which we're all offspring. That's the Apostle Paul's definition of theos. Jesus uses that word. He refers to theos as pater, which means father. He addresses the source as abba, which means dad or sir, uh, a, a word in between those. But he never once takes the word Yahweh on his lips. So I'm convinced it's a story of discontinuity, and it makes sense once you begin reading the paleo contact narratives and understand that the Yahweh stories fit in the pattern of invasion stories that you can find told by cultures all around the world. Having this knowledge is so, at least just general understanding, it would be so helpful for the average Christian, let's say, or not just for a Christian, but because we're discussing the Bible, it would be 
it would be very helpful. Why do we, why is there such secular teaching that is so bland, let's say? Because the story that you are weaving is one in which it's so much, it's very interesting, it's very deep, it's very complex. But the secular story is just, there was a guy, he was God, and he was good, and the, his dad was essentially the Old Testament guy. I just, why do we have such a disconnect? The problem with leaving it as it is, uh, leaving Christian believers thinking that Yahweh is God, is they have to justify all his behaviors, or they think they do. And if you're going to worship a xenophobe, you have to start thinking in a xenophobic way. If your God thinks of the world as my people and not my people, you have to think in that kind of way too. If your God justifies um, slaughters, well, you can justify slaughters as well. And the problem with elevating this Yahweh character into God, and in the Eden conspiracy, I show how that happened, means you've just empowered your kings and queens uh, and emperors to use violence and force and brutality to manage their own societies and invade other people's countries because they can do all that in the name of God because isn't that how God behaved? Once we disentangle this and realize, yes, there are God's stories in the Bible, but the Elohim and Yahweh stories are something else, um, we break the chain of that logic. And I think the real harm that's done by keeping it as it is is that Christians are taught systematically to ignore their consciences and to ignore the obvious and to pretend they're not seeing in the text things that are blindingly obvious. And once you've done that to people, you can really lead them anywhere. Yeah, that's always been a problem, I think, uh, for society. I mean, you see it in, in, in every, every great uh, nation has this disconnect between the people and the ones who are telling them, uh, or the shamans, or the high priest, or the, the someone who is translating these texts for them and saying, this is the story, this is how things, things are. And once that, that trust is, is there, the people go towards whatever it is that the high priest, whatever it is that the shaman says, whatever it is that the leader will, will say. And uh, actually, I think I want to go back. We didn't, did we get a firm definition on shadow people? No, we haven't got to shadow people. Uh, and it's, I think as soon as you start listening to the, the forbidden stories, uh, which are carried at the folkloric layer all around the world. So, I mean, if you want to know about paleo contact, you know, don't go to the mainstream media of any country. Don't go to the Department of Education. Don't ask for government booklets. Listen to the folklore. Listen to the local knowledge. And indigenous culture will tell you about paleo contact and by the time you spend any um, time with traditional teachers with shamanic teachers you'll come away believing that we live in a soup of company that there are all kinds of beings in this cosmos there are beings like us flesh and bone some of whom look very much like us some of us who are like us but taller some who are a bit more reptilian and other beings that may be interdimensional that can manifest in a way that's visible to us, but they're not three-dimensional in the same way that we are. And then there are energy-based beings that the early Christians talked about, the archons that are parasitic type entities that always keep company with biological life because they parasite off the emotional life of those beings. And then we have other beings that we're not quite sure what they are. And you will hear this sort of agnosticism in 1 John 4 that talks about contact experiences and in shamanic story around the world. And you mentioned shadow people. This is my most recent uh, video on the Paul Wallace channel. And I've been blown away. I think I've had about 1,500 stories of contact with shadow people shared in response to that video. And we can see that it's a spectrum of experiences, that there may be different kinds of entity that manifest as these beings that all you can see is the shape of a person in pitch black. And sometimes they'll look like they're wearing a hood. Sometimes they'll look like they're wearing a top hat, sometimes um, uh, a fedora hat, but you can't see any detail. And people's experiences range from terrifying to 
uh, actually feeling safe around them. And I think there are different kinds of being that manifest in our perceptual field in that kind of way. If you have a cat or a dog, you'll probably be aware that there are entities moving around that you can't see. And as long as your cat or dog isn't worried, I wouldn't worry about it. But occasionally your dog will start barking at that thing that's moving through your room and your cat will flare up and puff up its tail. So pet owners know about this stuff. But I think, again, it's a spectrum of entities, some nice, some not so nice, some indifferent. But as I say, once you're listening to the folkloric layer, you certainly don't believe that we're alone in this cosmos. Today's podcast is sponsored by Rode. We across Golarami use exclusively Rode audio equipment in order to do all of our stuff. If you are an influencer, if you're just a person out there trying to make some good content for your stuff at home, wherever it is, Rode is by far the best audio partner we have ever had. We have been using their stuff for almost five years now. Has never let us down. Truly incredible company, especially with all of the other affordable things that you guys can get from them. Check out the link right down below and enjoy the rest of this podcast. And it's such a, a, a tough thing to get through. And I'll just recount when I must have been somewhere between the age of 9, 10, 11, uh, I had seen there was a show in the US, I believe it was called Rescue 911. And it was a show, it was a 30 minute or maybe it was an hour show where they would show things that would happen to people when they uh, needed to call 911, which is our, our 112. I'm not sure what it is where you're at. But, uh, and there was a terrifying scene that I just kind of saw. It was very brief, a kidnap scene, something like this. And for some reason, you know how thoughts work and you know how our, our consciousness works. It kind of seeped in and it was kind of a thing that I was not scared of, but it was there in the back of my head, kind of this small fear. And uh, in any case, one night when I couldn't sleep, it had somehow bubbled up to the front of my consciousness. And I'm sitting there and I'm laying there and uh, I could see the stairs from my bed. Uh, just uh, a small portion of the stairs, let's say, you know, uh, it's hard for me to describe. But in any case, as I started, the fear just kind of ramped up and up and up. And all of a sudden comes this being some shadow looking thing, I guess is the best way to see it, that starts to come up the stairs, you know, slowly. Once again, I can see no, and I'm in the, once again, I'm in between this border of sleep and awake, right? So I'm unsure if I'm really truly awake uh, as, as if I'm running around or if I'm knocked out and it's completely a dream. That I can't be too sure of. But what I can be sure of is the vividness of the experience that I can recount it to you exactly, you know, so all these years later. And uh, I was terrified at first. But what was funny about it, when I went to scream, because I'm nine or 10 or whatever, nothing came out. Nothing came out frozen. I, I couldn't do anything. And then, then I, I was able to move. And once I was able to move, there was nothing there. So it's as if I did, did, did it happen? <laughs> was there something there? Was I just dreaming? Or what was this? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I really appreciate you sharing that, Will, because I think a lot of adults are embarrassed to share these stories because I think the moment you say, I saw a shadow person uh, and it was coming down my stairs, you expect another adult to say, Will, you were probably dreaming and think you must be an idiot if you can't tell the difference between being awake and asleep. But if you take a minute to read the 1500 stories of shadow people uh, on my video, you realize people remember the, th these things very vividly. They don't go around telling their friends because they expect their rea that reaction, but they still need to process what has happened, which is why they're telling me on my channel. And very often they will say this happened uh, at this address when I was this age. It happened once. It happened four times. It's very, very specific. It was in this room. It moved from this point to this point so full of detail. And they might say, it hasn't happened to me again in 30 years, but I've never forgotten it because I've never been able to understand what it was. Now, by the time you're in midlife, you're pretty familiar with the difference between being awake and asleep. You're pretty aware of what a dream feels like. And you know if you've experienced something that doesn't fit into the usual pattern. And by the time you've re read 1500 
of these accounts, you give a bit more respect to people's report and realise that something is going on that deserves a serious explanation. That is the key part, and that's the key part that I, I, I've been very happy to have this podcast to do, because if we can't convince you that something, something is going on, then uh, we haven't done our job, because I think that's really where we're at now, and I'm happy to keep that discussion going. What it is, I don't know, but something is happening. I want to give the example of my son's experience, because I think um, a lot of people experience these things when they're young when our brains uh, are in a slightly different vibrational frequency and we're in that liminal space a bit more often. And uh, my young son had the experience of shadow people for a few years. And one time, and it was always very specific, there's one that sits on the couch there with his feet on the cushions and his backside on the top of the couch. One sits over there and a smaller one always stands there. Then one day he said, One of them was in the hall. I've never seen it there before. And then he said one arrived, only this one was wearing a hat. And he said this one was terrifying because he just about coped with those previous experiences. But he said this one was different. It was terrifying. So a parent will usually say something like, oh, there, there, honey, you're probably dreaming. Don't worry about it. It probably was nothing. And all we're doing is trying to comfort the child. By this point, I've worked out something's going on and he's not super scared of it. He's just confused by the experience. So I said to him, can you draw what you saw? And he drew this figure wearing the classic shaman's headwear with the two horns. And I shared that in my recent video. And so many people have said, that's exactly what I saw. And they wouldn't wouldn't have dreamed of saying it if I hadn't mentioned it. So that's why I think it's good for people like you and me to share these stories because it does give permission to everyone else listening to share their stories and hope that they'll get a bit more of a respectful hearing. And if they don't, they can say, well, Will John had one of these experiences. Yeah, or Paul yeah, Wallace yeah, yeah. had those, yeah, but I don't, not just me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's funny. It's funny because I don't mind the, I mean, I consider myself already strange as it is. So I'm, I'm immune to that obviously, at this point. And it's been so funny. Uh, someone from high school literally wrote me just yesterday to say that he was listening to a podcast about out-of-body experiences. And uh, he, he got halfway through the podcast before he had realized it was me uh, talking with someone else who is one of these you know, superstar uh, OBE explorers to just say he had gotten into the subject uh, a few months back and was really diving into it deeply. This is this guy is a uh, you know he's a owner of a he was a CEO of some some large companies and stuff. Like that. It's amazing to see who really is what I'm I'm getting at is is into this and who these experiences. I don't I think everyone is obviously capable of having these experiences. More people are having them than they're saying clearly. But uh, the more this comes out, the easier it's going to be for people to discuss, and we can just get on with our day. You know, like okay, this stuff happens. We're, let's figure out what it is, and then let's continue. Definitely. One, one of the right, main motivations of my writing the book, The Scars of Eden, was to encourage people to share their stories, because I think we're, we're not usually comfortable with sharing stories of things we can't explain. But I think the moment an individual does that, they will find probably everyone in their friendship circle has some kind of story they can share of something they can't explain either, and sometimes they're actually itching to be given permission to share it. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yeah, every time I've I've started out, and when people find out, you know, about the podcast and stuff like this, they're immediately happy to share. They just don't have the forum for that in everyday life of, you know, trying to get some money and earn earn a living and whatever it is, and they just keep that to themselves. But of course, most people have some stuff that they cannot explain that they need to talk about and that they want to talk about. Um, Shifting over now, I want to discuss something else that you, you've got in The Invasion of Eden, which is uh, an understanding of the manipulation of currency and money, because this is a very important topic for everyone. Uh, maybe just give a basis, because I was shocked while reading uh, about the how ancient <laughs> the control mechanisms or, and the manipulation was going on. Let's start there. Definitely. Well, I mean... Uh, Anxiety about the control of currency is very topical 
Uh, there are lots of things afoot right now. People interested in holding their wealth in different ways so that their, their wealth can't be revalued uh, you know, by bankers or, or governments. And as I show in the invasion of Eden, this is a very ancient concern. So if I go to stories that are thousands of years old, for instance, in the Hebrew canon, we have the Elohim turning up. And what do they do? They annex the land. They divide it among themselves. So they cancel all previous patterns of indigenous ownership. They now own it. And once they've dispossessed the people of ownership of the land, the people can't work for themselves anymore. Uh, they will now have to work for the tokens that the conquerors will give them. They have to work for the conquerors' money. So you can hear that in the Hawaiian stories of the Mo'o, who did exactly that, annexed the land, separated people from it, forced them to work for money, and then started devaluing the money so that the people have to work harder and harder for their tokens to be able to buy the things they bought last year. Well, that's the pattern everywhere. If you think about the Romans' invasion of Palestine, they invade. Now people are going to have to start doing business in the single currency of the Roman Empire because if you're going to pay your taxes, you're going to pay it in Roman currency. Thank you very much. So you're now having to work for the conqueror's money. The conqueror mints it. The conqueror provides it. So there's no mistaking once the Romans turn up, the only people you're working for are the Romans. You work for the people who issue the currency. Britain goes into Ghana, replaces the local currency with British pounds. You now work for British pounds. You're working for the British. And once that change has been made, you are under the power of those who issue the currency. Because bit by bit, it will be devalued. You won't get any more hours in the day or days in the week. But if you still want a house, if you still want a certain standard of living, you're going to have to work harder and harder and harder to maintain it. And just to give you a, a shocking measure of this, between uh, 1800 and 2023, the British pound was devalued by 99.032%. Do you really think that wage increases have kept up with that? You can bet your bottom dollar. <laughs> no, they haven't. And you see it when you start comparing um, average incomes with the average price of a house. So in 1966, for instance, in Australia, if you wanted to buy a house, if a couple could work for two years on the income of one person, the income of the other person could buy a house outright because the average house price was 1.6 times the average household income based on a single income, 1.6. So after two years, you could buy a house for cash. Do you think you can do that after two years in 2024? You certainly could not. Uh, now, it's, now it's, I think, something like 7.6 times the average household income, which is now based on two incomes. And we've reached the point in Australia where it is really impossible for, say, a young couple, and um, pity you if it's only you as an individual trying to get the money for a house, a young couple is never going to be able to save the money it needs for a deposit in order to buy a house, let alone get a loan and maintain a mortgage. The new generation has been locked out unless mummy and daddy have a lot of cash they've built up as uh, baby boomers or maybe early Gen Xs. So the devaluation of currency is a very powerful tool. It is essentially an alternative to slavery. And this was really something modeled in the society of the ancient Sumerians, who were the first culture we know about on planet Earth to come up with a money system. Again, they privatized the land and they concentrated the population in cities, pulling them out of the countryside to living in denser conditions where they're working for money. And that's gradually devalued. The Apkalu taught that to the ancestors of the Sumerians, because that is how you manage a large, dense population. 
Now, this is a story that was told nearly 2,000 years ago by the priest Barossus, and it's a very subtle explanation of why all around the world there are uber policies designed to move people into cities to ensure that everyone is absolutely dependent on currency. That nobody can live off their own land. Nobody can really work for themselves. Because if you can make that shift, then you're controlling people through the money system. And it's just a matter of easy management. So that's a story that's 2,000 years old. And right now, people are beginning to rail against that. Yeah, and, and what I find so funny is that if you look at it through the eyes of control, you can understand how logical that is and how easy it is because you cannot maintain a massive population through uh, force that is, generally speaking, not, not good. What you want to do is have a system in, in place in which someone doesn't know uh, necessarily that they are either being controlled or manipulated in some, in some way or some fashion, and the devaluing the loss of purchasing power of the dollar is what you know as, a, as an american and, and watching watching that happen and i know that the, in australia and america there are uh, very close similarities and i think in europe as well this is that young people cannot buy a house just off of a simple average salary uh and two income homes uh, okay great and then we didn't add in kids <laughs> we didn't add in any other expenses for the you know that they're gonna have other humans to to feed and it's like what is the, where is the money supposed to come to put toward you know a better tomorrow and that's a that's a real big issue and i think uh, while these things have lived in the realm of conspiracy for so long it's starting to be quite logical if you start looking at okay well we're devalued and they're gonna they can print money they get to print money you don't get to print money Okay, if you do that, you go to jail. That's that's called you know, it's counterfeit money. But we can print money as much as we want when it, it it serves a purpose. And so I don't even know if that was going on. The great advantage of a society based on money is that you issue the money and then you take it back. So you take it back in taxes. You take it back in um, in tithes and tribute. Uh, and these stresses are used at different times just to keep people needy enough. And if you've got a society of farmers where everyone's growing their own food, producing their own medicine, generating their own power, collecting their own water, how do you control those people? Because they don't need anything you have. But once you sort of privatize that, I mean, in Australia, you, you're not allowed to collect your own water beyond a certain point if you're a farmer. You need a license for that. You're not allowed to build your own house outside of certain regulations. You're not counted as the owner of a house, even if you paid a million dollars for it, until you've paid a huge sum of money to the government for them to recognize that you bought that property, so on and so forth. So there are all these ways of making everyone dependent on the system, and an urbanized society uh, achieves that far more easily. And so the Barossa story is, is about that. It's not necessarily you know, a story of um, total darkness, because there are benefits to living in a city. There are benefits to the changes we've made. There are benefits to having a health system. But you can see there's a shadow side to this story as well, where if you've got a dependent people, that's great for the higher ups. Whereas if we've got more independence and self-sufficiency, that's better for the grassroots. Yeah, that's better for the people. Yeah, that sort of decentralization uh, with everyone being able to supply their own food, their own water, their own healthcare and things like this in their own communities would make sense. But yes, then how do you control that? If everybody doesn't need big papa at the top of the hill, then that does change things. So, I mean, there's a balance. I'm grateful there are cities with decent hospitals in them, but it really is about, well, how, how much freedom do we really have left and how do we achieve that? One of the most important things you can do if you're trying to earn more money is learn new skills. Stacking skills is one of the greatest things you can do in order to bring value to yourself and the people around you, especially one like learning a new language. I bet most of you guys had no idea that I could speak nine languages and that we have a YouTube channel with almost 100,000 subscribers where I do exclusively just that. And we break down the method for exactly what an idiot guy like me has done in order to do this. It's not complex, it's not complicated, and most of you guys have probably used the traditional method, and the traditional method sucks. That's why you can't speak any Spanish after four years of going to high school and taking Spanish week in, week out. 
If you want to learn to speak a language the fastest, easiest, and most natural way, click the link right down below. Golaremi Languages, we've got the method for you. Check it out. What about the Roman Catholic Church's, uh, let's say, power mechanisms now? I'm always fascinated because if you go read some of the, the stories, and I have a book here on the Templars just sitting waiting for me to, to dive into it, that they had armies back in the day. And there's no army now, per se, uh, moving out in any sort of imperialistic way. But they definitely have power, and they definitely have means of, of uh, collecting resources from all over the world. H- how do you see the, the Vatican and uh, the, the church the church's role within all of this, you know, within the governments and uh, within, you know, being important to the people and determining where and what we go, what we do with resources, where does the church fit in all this, especially as we go forward? What do you think is going to happen? Oh, that's a great question because the Vatican doesn't look like a geopolitical player in the modern era in the way it did say perhaps at the time of the Reformation, the European Reformation in the 1500s. But you're right, there's still plenty of power there, uh, plenty of wealth, plenty of information that the Vatican has about human history, human identity, information about contact, information about hidden technology. And in that sense, it's not so dissimilar to the Pentagon with uh, all the information and the wealth that they hold. The Pentagon uh, is bankrolled by, you know, trillions of dollars of black budgets. And uh, in a similar way, the Vatican is supplied with huge sums of money through property ownership all around the world. Both of them have hidden technology. So they're quite similar in a lot of ways. But um, there was something I was going to say that brought this home for me from the 1980s when I was uh, traveling in Brazil, I was there to study the churches. Uh, There was phenomenal grassroots uh, growth of communities of faith in the interior that were not controlled by priests, not controlled by hierarchy. People were finding each other, having powerful spiritual experiences, and then asking the question together, how do we organize our town differently? How do we uh, achieve a better living standard for the people of our district? And I saw that the Vatican was very upset about this and was doing everything it could to stamp this out. And the workers that were going around encouraging this, bit by bit, I worked out they were all monks and nuns. Uh, And this blew me away because that wasn't how I thought of monks and nuns. These monks and nuns were like revolutionaries. And I thought, well, why is is it them who are doing this work? And it was because there's a certain independence of the religious orders from the curia, from the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. And um, so I understood that the hierarchy had agreements in place with secular powers, with regional national governments, and they had agreements that they wouldn't allow their power to be destabilized by grassroots movements. So this is a profoundly anti-democratic energy coming from the top to keep those in power in power uh, for whatever benefit that flows to the Vatican, I'm not quite sure, other than that a lot of these districts are Catholic districts. And so there is a flow of wealth still in the present from Catholic countries to the Vatican. And so I was quite young when I realized the Vatican is still involved in geopolitics. It is still involved in shoring up this government and undermining this movement. Uh, I saw it in real time in Brazil in the 1980s, and it's no different today than it was then. Mm. Uh, And I I know this too, because I know Pope John Paul was a fascinating individual and very much involved when you start reading some, uh, let's say, biographies and different things from different leaders around his time and their relationships with him and how important, you know, (laughs) why is he having a discussion on where Poland and what Poland should or shouldn't do and where he's, you know, and he's thinking this is the Pope. Uh, but they have a different role. They have an important role. And you, you, you mentioned the Vatican Library. 
and I've always wanted to speculate on what is there. And you mentioned hidden tech. Could you speculate on what cool things they would have knowledge on or what sort of tech they might even have? What I'd particularly like to find in the vaults of the Vatican is all the good stuff that they got out of Central and South America from the Spanish and Portuguese invasions uh, because texts were sequestered at that time and uh, for the most part they were burned. Whole libraries were destroyed, uh, libraries which had carried the cultural memory of the Mayan people because the Mayan society was a, a, a society with writing. They had libraries. They were burned. We have an idea of what some of those texts were because there was suddenly an interest around the world in technologies for remote viewing. And so Queen Elizabeth I wanted to get her hands on technology that would enable remote viewing in that time frame following those conquests. So I think that was a part of it. If you look at the, um, the artistic canon of Central and South America, then you've got not only remote viewing and remote hearing technology named, but you've got the suggestion of more powerful weaponry and other kinds of higher tech that any national power would want to have rather than their enemies have it. So I think uh, the things we see portrayed in those carvings, which include um, space going vehicles, flying vehicles, and then remote communication, I think we've got texts and anything they found that was um, material, uh, that was 3D, they would have sequestered to the vaults there. So I'd like to look for that. There are other parts of the world where um, the technology of uh, portaling is named. So if we read uh, Genesis 11 and read that alongside the Sumerian stories, the suggestion is that there were beings coming and going from ancient Iraq through Stargate technology and portal technology. Uh, now that's a where is this? Sorry, where, where this is, is this? in is what this? today is Iraq. So any technology. No, where the text? There. Sorry. Say again. Where is the source? Sorry to interrupt. Where is the source of this coming from? The, with the portal technology, for where could what could I read about it or hear, Gen hear about okay, it? Okay, Gen Genesis eleven, and read that alongside the Enuma Elish which is a Sumerian text, one of the ancient Sumerian cuneiforms. So they identify technology in that part of the world. Now, traditionally, that's not been a part of the world where, where the Vatican has had much of a role. Another power has had to go in there to try and sequester that technology if it exists. And, of course, that was the USA. And uh, after the 2003 incursion, um, if I can put it this way, if you experience something anomalous while on active duty, you might be required to log it. You might be required to redact the report uh, or you might be required not to report it. But whichever of those three, you then have to never speak about it again. And people can only do that for so long. And since I published Escaping from Eden and the books that have followed, I've had a lot of people contacting me saying, I've heard this from my peers is usually the formula uh, I'm, or I've heard from people who had eyes on. I want to know what's the credibility of portal technology or Stargate technology. Uh, so I am persuaded that one of the reasons we were in that part of the world was if there was any possibility of ancient tech having been left behind. So we've got uh, the allies who are going in for that. Uh, in earlier centuries, we had the Vatican going into Central and South America for the tech there. And uh, when the British went into Ghana, they were very interested to get hold of certain artifacts there that were regarded as having power relevant to anyone wanting to maintain social control in that part of the world. And the British took it very seriously. They didn't take these stories as fables, fairy tales, legends, myths. They went to great lengths to try and get hold of the technology being referred to. And when you begin to look at some of the um, literature, say that the Pentagon has taken an interest in over the years, or when you start looking at the names that NASA applies to its technology, 
you'll realize that these ancient stories hold a great fascination for those with today's technology and in today's worlds of political power. So the, what's also been fascinating to me is why we have so many forbidden texts. Because you just alluded to all the texts that are in the Vatican Library. There's some texts there that you have no idea, right? There's plenty of texts in there that we don't even know. We don't know what we don't know. But we are aware of some uh, texts that were forbidden, at least from the Bible. Why do we have so many and why are they always, <laughs> I shouldn't say more interesting than, but they really, they're really interesting, the ones they don't put in. Why is that? Yes, that's right. They, they, they are more interesting, not just because they're the forbidden texts, but because of what's in them that got them forbidden. So at the beginning of Christianity, there was a great kaleidoscope of ideas, experiences, theologies, and texts representing what Christianity was. So that included the canonical texts and it included the pre-canonical and Gnostic texts. And so if you want to learn about beings who came and did terraforming on a devastated planet, you have to go to the Gnostic texts to hear about the craftsman or the demiurge. If you want to hear about beings that are not human, not exactly demonic, but they parasite of biological life and can manipulate politicians into behaving in a way that's more aggressive and paranoid and might lead to war. Again, you have to read the Gnostic text and read about the archons. If you want to get an idea of the range of stories that surrounded what happened to Jesus before, during and after the cross, you have to go to the forbidden books to realize there were a number of ideas about that. Or if you go to the Hebrew canon, the Hebrew canon formed roughly as we know it today in the 6th century BCE, but it was a rewrite of earlier stories of paleocontact, and they were rewritten to become a story of monotheism. Between that and the time of Jesus, there were other writings that were added that sort of were a bridge between that thinking and international thought or Greek thought as, as it was known. And so some other books were written that began exploring ideas of um, spiritual experiences, angelic beings, demonic beings, uh, us as eternal beings. These were new ideas. They're not in the original Hebrew canon. The idea that we might pre-exist this material experience and then go on to another kind of experience after that was in all these new books so they got excluded uh, as the hebrew canon was redefined by the jewish community in in the christian period and after the reformation the christians limited the canon as well to get rid of some of those because those ideas were a bit too interesting and i think one of the one of the most interesting exclusions uh, was in the definition of the Hebrew canon that decided the Book of Enoch wouldn't be in it. And if you want to know what's in the Book of Enoch, it's easy to find. It's, it, it wasn't burned, thank goodness. Uh, it wasn't buried in the desert and lost like the Gnostic text. It was buried in the desert for its protection because after Emperor Theodosius, non-Orthodox ideas were more or less illegal. And then it resurfaced after the Second World War. But during all that time, you could have just taken a trip to Ethiopia and read one of their Bibles because they kept the Book of Enoch in it. Well, whether you buy one off Amazon or you go to Ethiopia and read one of their Bibles, get into the Book of Enoch, and it won't take you long before you work out why it wasn't included. And that's because it's quite developed in the ideas of what uh, contact with non-human visitors meant in the deep past. And I've mentioned beings like Asherah, Hunhunapu, and Bab Wanorisa teaching us farming. But there's actually a rich cultural exchange described in the Book of Enoch, whereby these beings come who are described as watchers. They teach our ancestors which plants are good for food, which are good to avoid, which are good for medicines, which are good for higher consciousness. But they also teach them to dress more interestingly, to wear makeup and to start wearing adornments. And you realize the whole human experience is being enriched 
by this contact. And it gives a lot more layers to the story, which is only glancingly referenced in Genesis 6 as a story of visitation and hybridization. So a lot of Christians are aware of that. And some Christians have a notion of a populated cosmos because Genesis 6 mentions these non-human hybridizers. But I love the Book of Enoch. It's, it really is a fascinating book. It is an ancient book. It's written by an ancient person with an ancient worldview. But in the thought forms of the day, he's trying to process experiences and cultural memory using the language that he had available. We can read that today and say, I think I know what he's telling us. This is paleo contact. This is cultural exchange with another civilization that enabled our ancestors to make a massive leap forward. And it got excluded because what the empire wanted, I mean, the Roman Empire, out of Christianity and out of its canon, was a neatly ordered theocratic society where you've got God at the top and then the emperor somewhere close to him, then the bishops and the senators in the middle telling everyone what to do, making the laws, and then the priests and the people at the bottom just meekly paying, praying, and obeying. And what they didn't want was any suggestion that you could get an education or an understanding of the world outside of that pyramid of powers. Your only role is to believe what you're told and do what you're told. They didn't want a population who could say, yes, but with all this contact, I've got this other information. I've got information about the cosmos because I'm having close encounters. No, 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 no such thing as those. I, I've got a different understanding of things because I'm in contact with interdimensional beings. Uh, or actually, I'm not afraid of the state because the helpers I have have taught me not to be. They don't want any of that. They want a slightly distressed, frightened, slightly hungry, uh, utterly dependent population. And so this neat pyramid of powers, that's what a theocratic society should look like. That's why the canon of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, was pared down in the 6th century BCE to a story of monotheism. That's why the Gnostic text and the Book of Enoch were excluded at the beginning of Christianity, to keep the picture simple so that obeying God and obeying the state amount to more or less the same thing. How many forbidden texts out there are there, roughly? Oh, crumbs. <laughs> I, I couldn't put a number on it, but uh, but a lot. What we're reading when we read canonical text is a fraction of the literature. And that really goes for any part of the world that's dominated by any major religion. There are always battles over the canon and what people should and shouldn't be reading. And for centuries, the Catholic Church uh, maintained this list of prohibited books which included some of the greatest science of the ages. And I think if you can get hold of uh, just the list of those titles, many of which may be books that you have read, you'll realize how the control of thought has been such a major aspect of religion from the beginning right up until the present. One of the big themes uh, that we always try to do, and I, I asked you this uh, on the, our last podcast, is the application of the knowledge into something that you can weave into your daily, daily life. And, you know, we've taken a different uh, turn on this podcast, of course, with a, a lot of different things discussed. But still, I, I want to, to try and, and get a, a roadmap for someone who's trying to say, okay, they've listened to this podcast. Now, what do I do with what you've presented me? Whether that's going through and saying, reading some forbidden uh, text to try and get a better understanding of the bigger picture, or obviously reading your books uh, as, as well, or potentially we've, we've discussed remote viewing, we've discussed uh, you know, shadow people, entities. How do you best go about, or how would you best tell someone to go about furthering their mind so they can have some form of personal power from the knowledge and things that you're putting out, which is what I think is the most important, is that, like you said, if thought is being controlled, then how do we give you back control of your thoughts, at least in some form or fashion? Yeah. Well, I think once you've read The Eden Conspiracy uh, or The Invasion of Eden, which is coming out in April, you will probably find you've got an appetite to go and read some ancient texts, read some Plato. Uh, read some folklore, learn about the folklore of your, your own 
cultural background, folklore that your family has carried. And as you begin to read outside of your familiar bubble, you will keep having these light bulb moments where you say to yourself, I've always thought that. And bit by bit, your confidence grows in your own ability to perceive and understand things and your appetite to learn things grows as well. Once that is happening, the best way you can really put fuel to that fire is to be as healthy as you possibly can. And so in The Invasion of Eden, I talk about some really basic bread and butter things, which is how often are you unplugged from the matrix? So how often are you away from your technology in nature with your bare feet on the ground, breathing deeply in the air, letting sunlight on your skin and feeling good? Because that might seem irrelevant to the things we've discussed. And if you're not getting... Uh, exercise and activity so you've got enough beta endorphins in your system there is no way you will have the mental energy to think new thoughts make new discoveries reframe your beliefs or make any kind of transformative journey put those things in place and that's when all these other creative and wonderful things can begin happening so it seems like a disconnect, but in the invasion of Eden, I show how that really is connected. And then on top of that, we have to encourage one another in these explorations. If you can support someone else in any way so that they're a little bit less stressed, that is going to help them make these kinds of journeys too. I think when we realize that um, the higher ups is not as interested in our welfare as perhaps they should be, we have to rediscover one another the way our uh, grandparents and great-grandparents got through times when manipulation of currency had backed them into a corner and they were going through the depression, the only way they got through that was by helping each other, by growing their own food, by sharing their resources, by supporting one another, by patterns of co-housing. There are always ways we can find to help each other through stringent, testing, stressful times, and we need to find those ways. And I think when we help one another and when we prioritize our health and really are proactive in lowering our stress, that is when we make creative decisions and make creative discoveries and our whole world can begin to change. That's how we put fuel to this kind of fire. Guys, uh, we will see you guys later. Paul, thanks as always for doing this. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. Thanks for having me.